for joining us on Sunday morning. It's good to have you with us. And on the note of worship, maybe sometime we should talk about worship. It's interesting that this chapter we're in again, I just skipped over it. It says they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Maybe you can back some time and unpack that. Um, for today, we're actually going to get past verse 2, at least in terms of my teaching. Cam went ahead and taught on the big message in 13, which is awesome. But I'm going to get past verse 2 and look at uh, verses 2 to 12, I think it is. Yes. So let me read them from Acts 13. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus and said, You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. <coughs> Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Interesting idea of teaching there. Okay, that's the scripture. So my title is Power Encounter. We have <coughs> this going on. The Holy Spirit in Paul comes up against another kind of spirit and ambition in this sorcerer. So a little bit of context as always. So remember Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas has gone after Paul to bring him to Antioch. And that's where they are. Prophets and teachers with the group there. They've been teaching for some time. And now, those there in prayer, <coughs> worship and fasting, hear the call of the Lord to send these two out. So they head down to Seleucia, which is the port city. Antioch's just in from the coast. It's about 25 kilometers to get to the port of Seleucia. And then they jump on a ship, about 100 kilometers to sail to Cyprus. Cyprus was Barnabas' home. That's where he came from. We're told that back in chapter. So they head back to his home turf, which is interesting. First mission, familiar territory, at least to him. As far as we know, Saul had never been there before. Uh, overall, by the way, this intrigues me. The estimate is that Paul covered about 20,000 kilometers on the trips that we know about. Some of that was by ship, but a lot of it was with these two feet. I mean, we think about missionary journeys, and we stop and go, oh, they had to get there. There was no easy way, unless you were really well off, and then, of course, you'd have some kind of carriage, chariot. So lots of it was walking, perhaps 30 kilometers a day. So they had to get somewhere. That's basically what they did. So they land on Cyprus. They're in Salamis which is a major city at the time, it's about 150,000 people, and it has a substantial Jewish community. So when it says synagogues, it means plural. There are multiple synagogues in this town. Then they travel across the island, Salamis to Paphos, it's 
It's about 175K in total, and there's other cities in between. That says they preached the gospel as they went. What's quite unique about this account is it doesn't say anything about what happened. And it's the rest of the book is all about what happened. It just says they did it. Um, it doesn't say whether they were well received or poorly received, whether the Jews, some for and some against, which is what happens going forward if you go through the rest of the book of Acts. All we know is that Saul and Barnabas, they traveled and they spoke. And it strikes me as so unusual that no record is given us of what happened that I wonder if very much happened. <laughs> they slept and walked and talked. They went into the synagogues, they preached. We just don't know. It makes me wonder, did they hit considerable indifference? Oh, that's nice. Or, not nice, let's move on. It sounds like they didn't have reason to stop. They kept going. We just know they traveled and spoke. The other thing we know, at least on all the evidence we have, Saul, Paul, never went back. Whereas we know, on his other missionary trips, he cycled back many of the places he'd been before. No evidence he ever returned. And question for you. Do you ever feel the Spirit of God lead you into something? Convinced this is what God is saying to you? And when you step into it, it doesn't actually fly. You've never had that experience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, we don't know that what happened here, but let's say the silence is deafening. Well, there's a lesson in silence, often. Yeah. There is, and in this case, I think, I mean, we don't know. But the one thing we do know, we're going to talk about here momentarily, of course, is this power encounter that happens when they get to Paphos. But I just want to say this about this experience of you know, feeling called, you step out, you're convinced it's God, and then it's like, uh, I certainly have had that. And my natural instinct, very natural instinct, is to take a call as a promise, a blessing. So I would say this, I believe it is, but not necessarily the way I imagine it not necessarily on the time frame mm -hmm. that I think should fall. Mm -hmm. I confess I've been confused about this. I don't pretend to have it sorted out. Mm -hmm. Not for a second. But I think it's a reality. God calls us into things and that doesn't mean it's just all going to be a slide. He's, he's teaching, training us. Even in the things that don't go the way we think they should because we heard his call. And he's also, of course, training us to follow the call regardless of how it plays. So, uh, so the one thing in this whole island mission is this power encounter. So just a couple of context for this. Two other things that we could say generally about the experience at the start of the first mission trip. And keep in mind, of course, they're taking on the road what presumably they've been doing for some time in Antioch. They're used to teaching, preaching. This isn't new. It's just they're taking them on the road. Okay, number one. From this first mission trip, Saul disappears and we only hear of Paul. Now, there's a tendency to associate Paul with the convert that Jesus met on. He met Saul on the road to Damascus and he became Paul. But that's not what... Acts shows us. Um, he was still Saul. In fact, the name Saul Paul is just the difference between a Jewish name and a Greek name. And at the time, Jews who interacted with Gentiles tended to have a second name. A Gentile name, a Greek name that was recognizable, or a Roman name, if you like. And that's exactly what Paul was. It was Saul's Roman name. 
So from now on in the book of Acts, we don't hear Saul used again. It's just Paul. Um, keep in mind in Antioch, the church there was a mix of Jews and Greeks. He probably got called both, but he's Saul up till now. Now for Luke's purposes, he's Paul. That's the first thing. The second thing, at the same time that Paul is now named, Paul becomes the primary actor and spokesperson in this world. He's not solo for a second. He talks about them preaching, them doing things. But from now on, <coughs> the messages we do have recorded are Paul's messages, the ones that are actually spelled out for us. And the deeds or acts, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, those are Paul. They're tagged. At least in. They're a duo, they're still a team. But it's interesting that Paul now becomes the apparent front person, if you like. He's definitely the central actor in this encounter with Bar Jesus or Elamis. Okay, so let's set the scene here. Uh, <coughs> we have Bar Jesus, this sorcerer. The text indicates that Paul and Barnabas met him first. Who are we at the synagogue? Bar Jesus is a Jew. The proconsul, of course, is not. He's a Roman. He's a Roman governor. Um, so we have a Roman in charge. We have a Jew as his attendant, who's a false prophet. So Paul and Barnabas meet Alimus, Bar Jesus, and somehow the word gets to the proconsul of what Paul and Barnabas are doing, what they're speaking. It may actually have come through Alimus. That makes it really interesting what he did. We don't know. But the proconsul was curious, he was interested. We have this fascinating reference to him as a very intelligent. And it suggests, I think, that he was on top of things. He had an eye, and he had ears. He really kept track of what was going on in his jurisdiction, and he heard his message. And he wanted to know more. Bar Jesus, it looks like he probably introduced Paul and Martin. Proconsul, but then didn't like the indication that the proconsul was going to listen to these guys. Not to him, obviously. We have a picture here of someone who's jealous and didn't want to lose his special place. He was an attendant to the proconsul. He had his ear in some fashion. Didn't want to lose that. So we have, you know, if you think back, remember the story of. Peter and Simon the sorcerer who followed him around after he saw hands laid on and the Holy Spirit filled people. And he wanted that. He said, I'll give you money. And, and Peter spoke to him pretty strongly. Um, but Simon, of course, had been baptized. He had joined the faith. But then he wanted his power and he thought he could buy it. Um, in this case, it looks like Alimus didn't, obviously, join and get baptized. And so then we have a situation where we have proconsul, Paul and Barnabas in the room, and Remus is in the room. And there's some kind of tug of war going on. Tug of war. We don't know exactly, but it looks like whatever Paul and Barnabas are communicating to the proconsul, Remus is pushing back against, stalking back against, trying to obstruct. Who knows? Poking hole, trying to poke holes whatever kind of opposition it is. Presumably it didn't go on very long, because we have, first of all, just the situation that Paul and Barnabas have a private audience with this book, <coughs> which is special enough. So, Paul apparently didn't wait. Remember that some of you will know the story in Acts 16 in Philippi, where there was this slave girl who followed them around who had a spirit of divination, and she kept calling out. Mm -hmm. And that went on for many days until Paul turned and said, come out. And then, of 
person and the broken and the blonde. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but here it looks like in this encounter, whatever dialogue was going on, so <clears throat> Paul makes this very strong statement, which I emphasized in my reading. So I'll read it from the NIV again. It's kind of four parts of this. You're a child of the devil. He's addressing looks direct at you. You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. And then a question, will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? Very strong. My new Jerusalem <coughs> Bible ends that. It's got real smack. It says, you utter fraud, you imposter, you son of the devil, you enemy of all uprightness, will you never stop twisting the straightforward ways? In our language, we would say Paul really called him out. <laughs> right? At first glance, it, it's quite theatrical. Now it sounds like, ooh, big drama. And there was. But it wasn't theatrical in the sense of Paul amping himself up to make his points. Uh, it says here, Paul filled with the Holy Spirit looked intently at us. The statements were revelations. They were prophetic revelations. Basically tearing the mask <coughs> off this person the mask behind which he had camouflaged himself and been hurt accordingly. Right? He deceived people. We can assume safely, I think, that it was also a revelation. What came out of Paul's mouth was a revelation to the governor. <laughs> Up until then, he probably thought Alemus was giving him great wisdom. It exposed, Paul's words exposed what the governor had been listening to as twisted and untrustworthy. The other thing to keep in mind when we say the Holy Spirit's at work here, imagine making those statements and then going where he went next, which is to say, watch how the hand of the Lord will strike you, you will be blind. Imagine having had made those statements and then said that and nothing happened. That's then theater that doesn't play well. Or, let's put it this way, Paul would have looked very silly, especially when he was exposing a fraud and an imposter. To declare you're going to be blind and then he wasn't blinded. So who do we trust now? But he didn't give a timeline as to when he would be blinded. Absolutely, and that's very interesting you say that. He did not give a timeline, and sometimes, of course, these things happen all the time. Yeah. This one did smack. It happened immediately. He was struck blind enough, at least, that he groped and he needed help. It says dark and misty. He couldn't see the sun. So he was having a hard time. Um, <laughs> so there is drama in this. It's the drama, like the healing of a lame man, or what happened when Peter spoke to Ananias and he dropped dead. The words and the signs lined up. The words were a revelation of the power of God. The signs are a revelation of the power of God. And again, it only possible because Paul was filled with the Spirit. He had boldness. And he had revelation, and he had authority. Um, so, now we come to a really interesting question. You ever wonder why Paul can do this here, and then a few stops later, in Lystra, they stone him to what they think is death. What happened then? He went back to the city. That's what he did. Why did yeah, he do that? got up off the ground, and he'd go back. But I'm interested more in so, how does it work that this kind of authority is revealed, Alemus is struck blind, 
but on another occasion, Paul gets stoned and they think he's dead. They leave him. And then he gets up. It appears to be a miraculous recovery. And as you say, he goes back to the city. And I'm always reminded, this struck me decades ago, famous chapter about faith in Hebrews 11. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a glorious chapter. But when you get down deep towards the end of it, after listing all the incredible heroes of the faith, some of them, all kinds of examples of heroes of the faith, it says this. Some, this is some paraphrase, some shut lions' mouths, conquered invaders, put out fires. Others were flogged, imprisoned, stoned to death, sawn in hand. So, simple conclusion I draw. Faith isn't itself measured by success or heroic achievement. What looks like heroic achievement. It's not what it is. It's something else. And this, too, this power encounter we're talking about today wasn't success in that sense either. Because it wasn't a formula for dealing with opposition. Otherwise, think about what happens in the rest of Paul's ministry. There would have been a pandemic of blindness in Asia Minor. If every time someone opposed Paul, he said, the Lord is going to strike you blind. A big chunk of Asia Minor would have been able to see. Right? They would have run from him in hordes when they heard that he was coming. So. Believe or be blind. Right? Mm. That's not how God works. There's times. This is an intervention. By the leading of the Spirit, Paul was given authority. It's not a formula. Or he would have pulled it out of his pocket all kinds of times. His opposition was the name of his life. Of notes. Yes, sir. Sorry, could you just repeat that last turn of phrase that yeah. was given? So, Paul's experience going forward is opposition. Followers, yes, <coughs> believers, all kinds of people came to Jesus and trusted. Every, it seems almost every time that happened, then there were other people who opposed him, tried to shut him down. Kind way of saying is they tried to shut him down. Otherwise, they stoned him, they flogged him, threw him in jail, ran him out of town. But he didn't take this experience as a kind of model for how you deal with people who are opposing. It was not a ticket. He was being led by the Holy Spirit. He had to be responsive to the Holy Spirit rather than, oh, I know how now to deal with opposition. <laughs> yeah, does that help? Yep, good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for asking. Um, so a couple things here to note before we move in another direction. Who else got blinded? Paul. Oh. Yeah, that's very interesting. It was different in some ways, but he got stuck smack in his tracks, correct, by Jesus. I wonder if there was some persecution there. To, you know, like he says, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And he just needed stopping. He needed shutting up. I wonder if our Jesus needed the same kind of wham. Yeah, and think about Saul at that point. We call him Paul. His experience prior to that, of course, he was an opposer. He was the principal opposer. He was the guy standing in the way of the gospel persecuting Christians. The way, as it was known at that time. So that's interesting in this account. Paul had this experience himself. And it makes me wonder if Elamus was being called to repentance at the same time. We don't know anything that happened after. It just makes me wonder. I vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know, but Sure. 
Um, and then the other thing, the proconsul. Second thing I wanted to say. So what did he learn? Oh, in this one. Well, first of all, he learned the good news about Jesus. We can safely assume that Paul and Barnabas were communicating the gospel about Jesus, the one who came. The message that then we have later in the chapter in another location. He also learned that this Jesus, whom Paul and Barnabas was preaching, wasn't just a story or an idea. He was alive, he was well, he was powerful, and he had authority. The sign, and, and I emphasize that at the end of the reading, uh, let me go back to the text. <coughs> it says, when the proconsul saw what had happened, uh, my New Jerusalem Bible says, proconsul saw everything that happened. He believed. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So teaching here, it suggests it includes both the words and the demonstration of God, which is Jesus. It's exactly what Jesus' ministry was about. Words, demonstration of God. <sighs> Demonstrated, yes by a powerful sign. So, Ellen, were you able to find that? The grand cooking? The grand cook, yeah, that short one. I'd like to show you something. We don't have a projector, but I think if we bring it, I can't get it up. Yeah, okay. Maybe we can turn lights down. Yeah, can you see that okay? Yeah, let's turn the light. Who would my name? Perfect. That's better. Let me get my glasses one sec. <laughs> well, well, just before we start, I've got something to say, a couple things to say. Anyone ever heard of Graham Cook? Yes. I remember you did. Okay, some of you know started. He, uh, just quickly, so you have some context here. So we're, this is a power encounter, a modern day power encounter. Um, he's a prophetic gentleman from the UK who's been in ministry for several decades. And we first encountered him almost 30 years ago. He, as he says in passing, at the start of this, Jesus met him. He doesn't have his testimony in here, but Jesus met him when he was in a life of crime. He would actually, I think, jump the roll when he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, he didn't even know who Jesus was. It was a profound encounter, just like the kind of Damascus Road thing. He wasn't a persecutor. He was actually fleeing the law. Um, and a relationship began that was one of dialogue. I've run into a handful of people in my Christian experience of now many decades who have that kind of, just like talking. Jesus. Um, I think it's open to all of us. I think some are gifted in certain ways too. He has a powerful prophetic gift. The other people I know have this. Um, so this is a story from his early ministry. His first mission trip by the sound of it, which is also an interesting parallel, he makes no reflection on the text that we were looking at today. But I had seen this quite some years ago, and as soon as I got delving into this text, I thought, oh, let's just see, and then we can talk about it, okay? Oh, one other thing that maybe Let's leave it. Let's just watch it. We'll deal with it after. First time I ever got into spiritual warfare was on the mission field. And I was out there with um, uh, four Baptist boys and a Methodist. <laughs> and me, who got saved out of a crime family. So we're all out on the mission field together, and we're, we're like, we get, we parachute into this uh, uh, valley, and our, basically our plan is to walk out 400 miles and preach the gospel. Yeah? Brilliant fun. <laughs> so <clears throat> so we, get, we get to this place, uh, we get to this place, and this witch doctor comes out, and he's got skulls and body parts hanging off him. 
and he looks like nothing on earth. He looks grotesque, like something out of a movie. And he comes out, I don't understand the language, but I know a curse when I hear one. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> everyone stops except me. I'm walking towards him, and I'm just, I've never seen anything like this. And um, I'm just learning about spiritual warfare. So it's like, well, I don't even know what to do right now. You know? So, <laughs> but I'm not backing down. So I'm thinking, Lord, you got me into this. You're going to have to get me out of this. Otherwise, you and I will be shaking hands real quick. <laughs> so he's moving towards me. He's shouting and so on. And the whole village is cowering behind him. And I look around, and my companions are heading in the other direction. <laughs> So it's like me and him. And I'm just thinking, well, I'm not backing down. The Lord, you're going to have to do something. And heaven is silent. I'm saying, Lord, give me something. And the only thing that pops into my head is when I was a kid, I used to go to a place in a northern town in England called Liverpool, to a place called The Cavern, where um, the Who, the Beatles... The Rolling Stones, the Kinks, and all those guys, you know, they were all young guys playing homemade instruments, and I would just go, and it was great fun. And I used to buy Mick Jagger a pint of beer, because that's what we do in England. <laughs> <clears throat> and so all I can remember at that moment is Mick Jagger singing, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> it's the only thing that pops into my head, so I'm thinking... I haven't got anything else, so I start doing the whole Mick Jagger thing. <clears throat> it's, you know, when I'm driving in my car and a voice comes on the radio telling me more and more about some useless information supposed to drive my imagination, I can't get no. And that's all I'm doing. Satisfaction. That's, that's, and he takes one look at me. He screams out loud. And he heads for the hills and was never seen again. <laughs> I have no idea what is going on or anything. And I stop and I say to the Lord, what just happened? And all I can hear is the sound of him laughing. And laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. Like belly laughing. Like... He's, you just know he's drying his eyes with a handkerchief. I'm saying, what just happened? He said, that was the funniest thing ever. I said, why didn't you say anything? He said, son, I wanted to teach you something. What? And, he, and he's quiet. He said, I'm not going to tell you. Figure it out. So I'm standing there thinking, you want to... Oh, I get it. I could have the spirit of stupid on me and still win. I could be as dumb, I could be as dumb as anything, and I'm still strong enough to overcome something demonic. I get it. Your majesty covers everything. I get it. I get it. I have no idea why I told that story. <laughs> Except it was fun. So, I like that, the power of stupid. <laughs> um, well, I love God works. That wasn't a formula either, right? No. Imagine the next time you encounter an issue and you pull out Mick Jagger. No. Um, and Mick Jagger wasn't the answer either. As he said in the punchline, the answer was God. And God can come through all kinds of things. And he does. Comments or questions?
about that or about your sermon or about both? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just as you were speaking, and this just highlights it, uh, like about 30 years ago, you said to me, it's not, as we've all heard now, it's on posters and everything, but it's not about the destination, it's really about the journey and how we walk it. And I always think that faith, first and foremost, is an exchange between the child and God the Father. And that exchange of hearing what he wants us to do. And it's not about a formula. Because every situation is different. And God has a purpose that's different in every situation. And so it, it's really about an exercise of hearing what it is you're supposed to do. Even if you're in the realm of stupid, God, if you trust him and have faith in him enough, and you have faith to do whatever you think you're supposed to do, uh, that's what it's about. And, and I think you mentioned that so often we don't get the result. We think, well, God told me to do this, so there's going to be this immediate mm -hmm. expected result. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that God the Father, first and foremost, is in, he's interested in the result. But he is trying to make us like him. And so first and foremost, he is blessed that you took the opportunity and you had faith in him enough to follow him out of deep love for him. That's, I think, first and foremost what it's about. And if you fail, he actually isn't crushed or wounded or going to expel you from the kingdom because he's just blessed that his child took the time to have faith in him and trust him. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's interesting here, part of this too, of course, is that Graham was prepared to make his, meet his maker. Mm. And like, that's why I'm here. If it doesn't fly, it's not really my problem. It's your problem. <laughs> um, and that's that's a position that comes out of faith too and and doesn't tie God's hands I mean, we could ask the question so why, why didn't the Lord give him the scripture <laughs> and then that leads to the question I was going to ask before we watch this it's a bit of a oh, does God laugh Yes. Oh, oh yeah. We must be creating a plot of this. Oh, just, uh, <laughs> really laugh. Oh. Does he find things funny? Oh, yeah, terrible. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you put together the infinite creativity of God. Just these two things: infinite creativity and an enormous sense of humor. <laughs> and what do you get? Lots of laughter. Lots and lots of laughter. You know, a few years ago, someone gave me something to watch from a Bible teacher that stuff was on the web. In it was this statement that there's no jokes in the Bible. I thought about it at the time. I mean, I'm not aware of anyone saying, have you heard the one about? <laughs> Two rabbis and a Pharisee man. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's lots of funny stuff in the Bible. Yeah. Well, if, if, God, if we're created in God's image, I have to think that he gave us the gift of laughter for a reason. And if we're created in his image, it would go to, go to, it would stand to reason that he is able to laugh because we're able to laugh. We're able to find light in humor, even at some of the darkest things. Um, so, yeah, like, like it just got laughs. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he created the platypus. It, it, <laughs> that, that has to create laughter. That is the strangest thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Margaret? I'm going to just, I have a power with God, a real power. Um, I was in Courtney. It wasn't humorous at the time, but it was mind blowing. I was going, I was, I was working with a church that had lots of problems and we were all praying and there was a lot going on in the spirit world at that point in time. So there was a lot of trouble around us, but I just, but I was going to, I had to go somewhere and that's where I was going. And I was driving my car and I got up, this was in Courtney, going up Ryan Hill. I was got, I got up on the hill and my... I was driving and I lost control of my car. 
I'm, new, I'm all over the place. I'm really all over the place. And I am driving and I am freaking out. And I, I'm not centered, I'm not talking, I'm just, I don't have a point of peace or anything. I am freaking out. <laughs> so right beside me on the seat, in the passenger side, it says, do not fear, it shall not come nigh thee. And I was going, okay, I'll bite. What won't come nigh me? <laughs> he says, you're tired blue. And you, and, and you know, my tire blue, go to the gas station. And I am heading to the gas station. I'm all over the road, and I've lost. You lost, and people are honking at me, left, right, and center. And I, <laughs> all I know is to go to this gas station two, two um, miles down the road, good gas station. And I went, and I, and I know that I, I should stop and get help. I knew I, but you know what? Something kept me going. Go to the gas station. He said, go to the gas station. So I went to the gas station. So I went into the gas station. I got out of the car, and there was my tire smoking, ripped to pieces, utterly destroyed, and all I can think of, I hope I have my credit card in my pocket. <laughs> I'm going, looking at this. My husband's going to kill me. So I'm looking at this tire. And I went into the gas station, and I went, uh, uh, excuse me. Do you sell tires? And he looked at me. He says, we are a tire gas station, yes. And so I said, I need you to go look at my car and come back and tell me how much I owe you. I have okay. So he went out and he came back and he said, which tire is it? I said, oh, you are so dumb. I said, <laughs> you do not know what a ruined tire looks like. I said, it's a shadow, ES. It's a black car. Can you please? Please go look. And he says, okay, I'll go back. And he came back and he says, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And I went, I don't know. I don't know anything at this point. And I went looking at, and I had four complete tires what? on my, <laughs> my car. And I had a, a, I had a, I had a, a leak in that tire. It never leaked after. And I was going like this and I'm going, Okay, God, this is above my pay grade. I don't know what to think of this moment here, you know. And so, and God totally healed my car. <laughs> and I, and I'm talking to this guy as though I'm gibberish. I lost my sense of, you know. Oh my God! And he's looking at me like, I, I, um, I imagined the whole thing, but I know in my heart, with all the cars honking at me, and what I saw that my tire was totally destroyed and shredded and smoking, and it had asphalt on it, that God totally healed my car. That was, and I was totally over them. <laughs> steps in and we look silly but he looks really good sometimes that happens too yeah.